Okay. We're going to be here in Judges chapter 17, but let's pray first uh, so we can open up tonight. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for meeting. It's always a pleasure and a joy to get together. The warm fellowship, the kindness, the interest. Uh, we just thank you for these things. We know it's because you lead us in your way, in your truth, and in your character so that we know how to treat one another. So we lift up this time. We pray that you would uh, give us the message that you want us to hear and, as always, apply it to our life. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're in Chapter 17. And... Before we read the first two verses, I want to explain a little bit about 17, or really 17 through 21. Uh, the, the 16th chapter ends the chronological part of the book of Judges. So everything that we're going to do in 17 through 21 is not chronological. It happened sometime during the period of the Judges, but didn't necessarily happen after Samson's time, mm -hmm. we're not given in these in these uh, uh, chapters any specific time frame, so we don't know. Uh, obviously, they're anecdotal and they are recorded events which occurred, but just we don't know exactly when. Okay. Now, the key to all of these chapters, as we finish off the book of Judges is that they all show how morally and spiritually corrupt that Israel became. We're going to see that the nature of what happened in Israel affected the homes, that is the home life, the home relationships, the social relationships, the social order, and even the national identity. They all became corrupted. So one of the things I want you to think about as we go through tonight is how this might apply to today. And I think you're going to see some real analogies here. This is one of the things I think it's interesting about judges is that you don't really think of judges as having necessarily any prophetic nature. But in reality, I think it does have a prophetic nature in many, many places. And I think we're going to see that tonight. So let's re read verses 1 and 2 and talk about them first. So chapter 17, now there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver which were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse in my hearing, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. Now, this is bizarre. Yeah. And I'm going to try to point out how bizarre this really is. First of all, Micah's name is very interesting in Hebrew. It means who is like Yahweh. And he's the main character of this chapter, and actually even into the next chapter. And it's ironic because certainly... He is not like Yahweh at all. And you're going to see how much he's not like Yahweh. Uh, as a matter, and keep in mind, we're familiar with the name Micah of the prophet Micah back in the minor prophets that occur. And this is not that Micah. It's a different Micah. Okay, so don't confuse the Micah who wrote the, the prophetic book with this guy. And as you're going to see, what he does is, isn't anything even close to what the, you know, Micah the prophet did or, or, or advocated. So obviously he lived with his mother. His mother obviously gained a, cons a considerable amount of silver. It says 1,100 pieces. And so again, if we calculate that at today's rate, she accumulated it, approximately $10,000 in silver. Okay. So certainly is not a small amount of silver that she has. Now, it states that the money is stolen, okay? 
And then it quickly states who the thief was. Who's the thief? Her son. Her son. So the son steals, you know, uh, this $10,000 worth of silver. Now, she then quickly utters a curse. Remember? Read it again. Mm -hmm. They were taken from her, about which Micah says, you uttered a curse in my hearing. Now, I want you to turn. I want to look at it. I want you to show you how absolutely unscriptural this whole thing is from beginning to end. I mean, it's just absolutely, almost call it anti-scriptural. So I'm going to point out a lot of examples in the Torah about how backwards this whole thing was. So the first one I want you to do is I want you to turn uh, to uh, Leviticus 5. So go back from Judges, back into the Torah, into Leviticus Chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. So here's what it said, is said in the Torah. If a person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good, in whatever matter a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath, and it is hidden from him, and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty of it, uh, be guilty in one of these. So it shall be when he becomes guilty in one of these, that he shall confess that in which he has sinned. In other words, the Torah warns you, don't easily make an oath or swear or utter a curse about anything. Make certain that if you utter an oath, you better be able to perform it. And do what you say, because whether it's, good or bad. whether it's good or bad, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. The point is, it's, you have to be careful what comes out of your mouth to the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's okay. All right. You have to be careful. So she utters this curse that has to do with the theft of her money. Now, if you go back into ancient Canaanite traditions, ancient Canaanite religion, going all the way back, as far as you almost want to go, even back to the Ugarit days, the Sumerian, the Akkadian cultures, which way predate the Babylonian, you find this constant uh, um, discussion in their literature and in their writings about uttering a curse. And of course, the, in essence, what it is, as you go back in Canaanite culture, is a curse represents a spell. That's what it is, okay? It's a spell. And, of course, they put spells against people. And, of course, therefore, this thing has an occultic nature. So a lot of their literature involves uh, talking about how to undo curses, how to undo spells. They would utter curses if they were angry at someone, and they would utter a curse or a spell about, you know, uh, uh, some kind of illness falling on them. You know, Babylonian literature is just filled with this stuff. And they had all these different shamans that they would hire all the time. It's amazing if you read it, because they're, they're constantly thinking what their neighbors have put on them as a curse, and they're constantly having to go to the shaman and pay him to make certain that the curses are being lifted off of them. Can you imagine living that way? It would almost be like today living in Haiti, you know, where there's this constant, you know, curses, but you don't know who's cursed you, you don't know what, voodoo and all this. Well, this this is really what we're talking about here. Question. Yes? Um, if someone curses us as Christian, they don't, this curse doesn't have power. So. No. No, it doesn't have power because in the blood of Christ which cover us, you know, we are covered by the power of Christ and therefore it, it, it cannot affect us. You know, uh, so no. The Holy Spirit is our yes. protection. It is our, and that's why, and you talk about people that, as missionaries that are in many of these cultures, and it's remarkable how they go through these cultures, and many times they have to pray for people who are cursed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And of course, that what they pray, and the only way in which the curse is undone, is if they receive Christ. If they accept him, then the curse will be lifted. Remember, what does it say about Christ? He became our curse, curse mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that we should become you know, forgiven in him. So it's very interesting. But this is not what's going on here. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a curse that's a spell. Now, of course, Micah fears the curse when he hears it from his mother, right? The sad thing is he doesn't fear the sin of stealing from her. He does, <laughs> That's not what he's upset about. He's upset about this curse that she utters. All right? So, instead of her being instead of her being angry at him, she then it says in the texts utters a blessing. Now think about how weird that is. Yeah, I don't understand that. Well, the reason why she does it is because this is a curse. And so now she's trying to undo the curse on him when he returns the money by uttering some type form of blessing to undo the curse. It's absolutely occultic in nature. There's nothing, you know, Hebraic or about this at all. There's nothing that has to do with the Torah here. There's nothing to do with the kingdom of God. That's not what we're watching going on here. So she tries to counteract the curse. And interestingly enough, what does she do to try to do it? She invokes the name of the Lord. But there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever she knows the Lord in any way, shape, or form. Mm. So what we're seeing here in the first two verses is pure superstition. Mm. This is what the culture has devolved into here. Pure superstition. Okay? Make sense so far? Mm -hmm. All right. I I had to add that because I think unless you go into some of the the literature and some of the language, you don't get the idea of what's really going on here. But this is what's going on. Now, it is also hypocrisy, isn't it? it when she uses the, the, the name of the Lord, it is. It is very hypocritical, you know. Well, one thing she's cursing, the next thing she's saying, hey, right? Right. Yeah. Even think of even think of what James says: out of the <clears throat> mouth of the believer cannot come both fresh water, and salt water. In other words, let your yes be yes, your no be no. It violates all of these principles, New Testament, Old Testament. So let's read verses uh, 3 through 6, and we'll cover these. So he then, Micah, returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, uh, it gets even more bizarre here, I wholly dedicate the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will return them to you. Seem a little weird to you? She has mental <laughs> <laughs> No, she had spiritual problems above all else. So verse 4, so when he returned the silver to his mother... His mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave them to the silversmith who made them into a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household idols and consecrated one of his sons that he might become the priest. Weird. So let's go through it and explain it. It does. So Micah returns the silver to his mother in which she, quote, dedicates wholly to the Lord for a religious purpose. But as you realize, she she dedicates it wholly to the Lord, but only uses 200 pieces of it, all right, exempting 900 pieces of it, although she says she wholly dedicates it, but she doesn't wholly dedicate it, all right, and makes two things with it. She makes a graven image, which means it's, we don't know what it was of, but it was some idol that was probably carved of wood and then plated with silver. That's what a graven image means. Then she takes another amount of the silver, and as a silversmith meld it down, and makes another idolatrous image that's, of course, pure silver. 
This is what she does with the 200 pieces that she, quote, dedicates. Can I ask a question on that? Yes, you can. Given what we're reading here, was that typical of those times that Kennedy household would end up doing something like that? We have a history all the way through of people that are not either believers or have a very distorted concept of you know, the Old Testament of the Torah that make the household, make household idols. The, we're going to talk about that. It's the word teraphim in the Hebrew. And it meant kind of two things. It, it was a household God, and it also was something that indicated property rights. So apparently they would inscribe on it or something like that, something that gave it uh, a, a a property or almost a deed kind of concept to it. So we and you can go back and look at teraphim and idols all the way through. I didn't do it. You can look at it all the way back into Genesis. They they were they were relatively common, but they also they were always idolatrous. They weren't God's intention ever. Not part of that um, Egyptian culture. Yes, and Canaanite culture. In the desert, they. One of the first yeah. things they did, they, they made and that. Well, probably because they were two common things that were done as idols. The graven image was one, the molten image was another. And the, the teraphim tended to be more the graven image. Uh, the molten image, as you just said, which is a really good point, you know, the, the children of Israel come out of Egypt. Now, there's a very important verse we often skip. As they're leaving Egypt, what is it that they get? Because the Egyptian people are so thrilled to get rid of them after the ten plagues. Gold jewelry. So they accumulate gold and silver jewelry. So they accumulate all of this gold and silver jewelry that people are saying Take it, get out of here. We're done with you. You know, you've decimated our land with your with with your God, Yahweh. So what happens? They finally go through the miracles of crossing the sea. The Egyptian army is destroyed. They get over to the, the into the wilderness there in Saudi Arabia, in northwest Saudi Arabia. They complain about having no water and food. And what's almost the next thing that happens? Well, when Moses goes up the mountain, then they kind of tired of waiting. They just take all their stuff and say, well, we're going to leave. We're going to make ourselves something. And if you think about, uh, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. No, uh, go ahead. This goes to many cultures. Like in Russia, many people would have images, icons. Icons. Images. Oh, yes. Like, And it was close to the very owner, the holy corner of the house where they were literally stand on the knees and pray for it. Really? So it was like a, an image of God, okay. quote unquote. Or in China, it's important for them to have this metal, uh, you know, little statue of Buddha to oh, have yeah. in a certain yeah. place at home. And if you go to any Chinese store or restaurant, they, they got to have it somewhere. It's pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very common cultures, ancient and cultures. Of course, said in his law, one of the first things that don't make any image. And that's exactly what we're going to look at. So turn to Exodus 20. I guess I asked a good question. You did. You did. It's exactly what Anna just said mm -hmm. about don't make any images. It's the first thing. Let, let's read 20, starting in verse 1. Exodus 20. Then God spoke all these words, saying... I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In other words, it was my miracles mm -hmm. and my power that got you out of there. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. So they just broke that by making these idols and having a teraphim in their household. Number two, okay, you shall not make for yourself any idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Okay? You shall not worship them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children 
the third and the fourth generations to those who hate me. Now, it's interesting. Well, no, I'll that, just, that also means don't make idol of anyone or anything. Yeah, and, right? and of course it does. And we're going to look at a couple other verses here. But, you know, part, the reason why he said, notice he says, don't make any idol of what is on the earth above. Do you understand why he says that? What Nimrod do when he built the Tower of Babel? What's, what's he make on the top of it? He inscribes the Zodiac because it becomes a way for them to channel the, the uh, you know, the demonic entities in Babylon. What is the word Babylon? We said it before called in the gate of the plural gods. Okay? So right away, we have him channeling these entities onto the earth. So it was common for them to make a zodiac, okay, and use it to try to channel entities to do various things. So he prohibits that, and then he prohibits, of course, any of the water spirits, you know, or the entities that were involved with many of them, Poseidon, you know, we have a whole history of these kind of things. So they've already broken several of these commandments right away. Um, as a matter of fact, as you go on, you realize that they broke at least five of the Ten Commandments right here in the first few verses. They make graven images. They worship the images. Okay, what's the next thing they do? Okay, they steal, verse 15. Uh, they covet because he coveted the silver of his mother. You know, and you, and you go on and on. So there's at least five of the Ten Commandments right away that they break in the process in a very short period of time, seemingly. Now, Ann, do you have a question? Uh, you answered it. Okay, good. Good. Well, I have a question. Well, not a question, kind of. Because this, this subject is of uh, the subject of idol and idolatry. Kind of, I thought a lot about that. And if you think we all often have some kind of idol in our lives. For some people, it's uh, mm -hmm. money, power, money. Yes, true. All those things can be idols. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we're gonna in a minute we're gonna look at two verses of the New Testament that warn us about idolatry. So anything what you love more than God, it, it is idol. It is an idol. Absolutely. And it's kind of if you think about it, you know, like changing your children. It can be. You know? Mm -hmm. right. So like cross, like a cross necklace that I wear a lot, or uh, Christian fish earrings, would that be idol? No, I, I don't think so. No. I'm not worshiping it, though, or pray for it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're symbols of what, they're symbols of faith. Okay. They're appropriate symbols of faith. I mean, what could be more central, obviously, to the message of Christianity than the cross? All right. But of course, like you said, you know, the Western Church, the Catholic Church, had a history all through the medieval ages of selling icons themselves for indulgences. Mm -hmm. You would purchase a piece of, quote, the cross. You would purchase some element that they claimed was somehow connected to Christ, and they'd pay money to the priest to do this. And then the Eastern Churches, on a just said, did the very same thing. They built icons, and of course they would claim that they could pray to them and the icons would bleed, right? Yeah, and of course it's simply idolatry, again. Now, interestingly, I want you to notice something. It says that uh, it's in verse 5, end of verse 4 that this graven image and the molten image which mother had made, and they were in the house of Micah. Now keep in mind what this means. It means, in Hebrew, Beth Elohim. Micah's making his own house of God. All right? But in it, he already has shrines, that is teraphim. He already has, which are house idols, he already he puts in there a graven image and a molten image in this house of God that he creates. 
And he also, notice in the, in the verse, says that he somehow made an ephod. Now, do you remember what an ephod is? It was the priestly garment. So somehow he had some ephod made, and I'm pretty darn certain it had looked not like the ephod in the Old Testament, because certainly they clearly did not understand these things. They were far, far away from biblical understanding in the Torah. Uh, it's interesting also that he made this priestly garment, this ephod, turn, uh, turn back, hold your place there, and turn back to Leviticus 8. I want to show you how many violations are going on here. Now, how cold idols were the same like the daughter of Zeus, daughter of God? Uh, Laban, remember? <clears throat> Those were teraphim, household yeah. eyes. Yes, absolutely. You're exactly right. That's what happened with Laban and the, and the uh, Rachel and Leah uh, uh, stole the household idols. And when Jacob and all the family took off, Laban took after them uh, for numbers of reasons. But he wanted the household idols back was one of the reasons. So Leviticus chapter 8, I want to show you another violation here. Uh, we're going to read verses 5 through 7. Okay? It says, Then Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. In other words, this isn't Moses' opinion. This is God's ordinance. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, Then Moses had Aaron and his sons come near. So who comes near? What tribe? The Levites. the Levites. If you're going to be a priest, where did you have to come from? Levites. No other tribe could have a priest. Mm -hmm. Only the Levites, right? Mm -hmm. So, he, and he says, has his Aaron and his sons come near and wash them with water. <laughs> Verse 7, he put the tunic on him. This is what we're talking about now, This uh, an ephod. And girded him with the sash and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him, which includes a hat, a specific type of hat, and he girded him with the artistic band of the ephod. Remember, the ephod originally is described as having, it's almost like a, a piece on it that has 12 stones, mm -hmm. stones for each one of the 12 tribes. So it has this elaborate symbolic meaning that God himself had them make. He directed them how to do it. Uh, uh, and, he, and he says, which, of course, the ephod was tied on him. And, of course, then it goes, talks about the breastplate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is, of course, what the real ephod is supposed to be. And it could only be a Levite that could do it. Mm -hmm. So where is it we learn in verse 1 that Micah comes from? Uh, Ephraim. Ephraim. The tribe of Ephraim, not the tribe of Levi. Okay, so he's not a Levite. Hey, but he's trying to be a priest. The next guy is from Judah. Yes, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Also, look at uh, turn over since you were in, uh, in uh, Leviticus to chapter 18 of Leviticus. I want to look at another verse here, Leviticus 18. I want you to notice this also. I'll start in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall do what is done. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt, where you've lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. So here's the injunction. Don't bring the traditions of the Egyptians into my my congregation, and don't assume the rituals and the religious aspects of the Canaanites. So right away, they're forbidden to do these things, okay? Uh, don't bring them into where I'm bringing you. You shall, you shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with me. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live. If, uh, if he does them, I am the Lord. 
none of you shall appoint any blood relatives of his to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord, you shall not uncover. And he goes on and talks about these other statutes, these other laws. So it's very clear what they're not supposed to do and what they are supposed to do. Again, they're violating this. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Micah is an Ephraimite. And he has no right to perform any priestly service whatsoever. Interestingly enough, what does he do? We read in another of these verses here. He decides to pick one of his sons to make him a priest, who also is not a Levite, right? So all of this points, of course, to what we call religious syncretism. It's a word we use. It's important to understand it. Syncretism means a little of this, a little of that, a little of a third thing. You bring them all together and you make this conglomeration, this mishmash of religiosity. And what we see on the figures Very good. Yeah, coexist, right. That is absolute syncretism. It, you're, it's a, I'm glad you pointed that out. That bumper sticker is the epitome of syncretism. It should offend you as a Christian. You cannot combine Judaism, biblical Christianity, <clears throat> Islam, Eastern religion, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, you know, uh, Taoism, it's absolutely, you know, it, 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 it's, it's absolutely an abomination from, from a Christian belief standpoint to do these things. This is what we see, though. Now, you pointed out earlier something that's important about idols. So let's just leave your hand in Leviticus, but let's turn to the New Testament and look at two verses about idolatry. Turn first to Colossians 3, just after Ephesians, we have Colossians. Look at verse 5, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, to impurity, to passion, to evil desire and greed, which all amounts to idolatry. All of those things have as at their base idolatry. That's the core thing behind all of them. Why don't you also go a few chapters over here, a few books over, to 1 John 5.21. So go past James, past Hebrews, past First and Second Peter, to First John, and I want you to look at the last verse of First John five. Okay, verse twenty-one. This is his last admonition to the church. John the apostle. He says, "Little children, guard yourselves from idols," and that's a huge category of potential things that we can have as idols. Now, um, talking about the syncretistic idea, I want you to turn, since you're already in 1 John, back to Colossians, to what I think is a very important verse. Matter of fact, it's not only a, a very important verse, it's connected to a whole set of very important verses. Back to Colossians chapter 2, and I want us to read verses 20 through 23, the last four verses of the second chapter of Colossians. Paul makes this very important statement. We call this an identification truth. We're identified with Christ. He says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world. Keep this in mind, the elementary principles of the world. Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, all, which all refer to things destined to perish, in other words, they're just material things, 
with the with uh, in their using in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. See, these are the commandments and teachings of men, not necessarily the commandments and teachings of God. Verse 23, and here's the really important verse. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but of no value against fleshly indulgence. He's warning against self-made religion. Is that like, uh, like Catholic? Uh, There's a lot of elements of self-made religion. Like they do the There's all sorts of things that, are, that may be, but what it means is, and let's notice, I'm going to look at it, we're going to look at a couple of Greek words. They have the appearance of self-made, uh, 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 let's, let me read it again. They have the appearance of wisdom in self-made, that's the phrase we want to look at. All right? Now, appearance uh here means reasoning in the Greek, calculating, and involves a human, logical, or seemingly correct concept. It's a man-made view. I've thought about this, and this is the way it seems to me. Okay? That's the word for appearance. Wisdom, uh, and it's literally the Greek word logos. Okay? Logos. Now, wisdom, of course, it does. It means a number of different things. Okay, it does mean word. As a matter of fact, turn to the Gospel of John, and you're going to remember in John chapter 1, I want you to look at Verse 14, and the Logos mm -hmm. became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, that is the true Logos, mm -hmm. okay? And Jesus is the Word. It says he became flesh, he took on human form, and he is the only true, unique representative of Yahweh, his Father. That's it. That's what the Bible teaches. That's the central teaching of the entire New Testament. All right? Now, I want you to look at another verse here. Go back to Colossians chapter 2. And there's another verse I want you to see. It's also important. Back past Philippians to Colossians 2. And we're going to look now at verse 8. It's another warning. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men... According to the, again, he's used this phrase before, elementary principles of the world mm -hmm. rather than according to Christ. Now, let me go through that with you in the Greek. Take you captive is the word uh, silagogio. It literally means to steal from or to make you a slave or to lead you away from the truth, distract. to distract. Mm -hmm. Of course, the word philosophy is the word philosophia. It's almost a literal translation. And the word philosophia in the Greek means the love of wisdom. It literally also means, interestingly, the skill of science. And this leads to what, in this verse, is empty deception. Kinos apate. Kinos means empty. Apate means deceit, delusion, or sophisticated trickery. 
It's a lot of things. Yeah, lot of things. But, but notice the basic point that Paul's trying to make here is that man comes up with something that makes sense to him, whether it's the theory of evolution or whether it's a scientific concept or whether it's philosophical pursuit or whether it's a syncretistic religious view like coexist, okay? This is a man-made concept. There's only one right logos, truth, and that, of course, is the Word, Christ. And that's who we need to cling to. Now, if you want to do an interesting study on your own, I'm going to give you some other verses. I was, I literally kind of tore them apart in the Greek, and I thought, we're going to be here all night if I do this. <laughs> Okay, they are. I even had a discussion with my mom about it. Oh, good. Because you think um, why it's important because many people get so distracted and deceived, not, not necessarily deceived, but distracted by someone's teaching. They do. Or someone's concept. Mm -hmm. I'm always very careful. Yeah. Right. Me too. I have yeah. to stick to this. Right. Yeah. I'm you, the you remember one of the verses I frequently quote to you when I teach is always remember Acts 17:11. Okay? For the Bereans were more noble for the, those who went Thessalonica, for they sought out daily looking in the scriptures to see if such things were so. Yeah, but many people are very deceived. They are. You know, they 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 think that, well, this sounds like Christian philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it, it teaches good, it teaches fine things, and, and this is Satan's strategy to just uh, mm -hmm. take people away. It from is. And it's occurring with incredible frequency today. I'm going to, in a minute, read you two articles I pulled that I hope, when I read them, will shock you. Mm -hmm. Okay? I hope they will shock you because of what they're talking about. So, but I'm going to give you these other verses if you want to write them down. All of them are related to the ones we just looked at. Okay? And here's what they are. And I would really tell, if you have some time, read these and go to a Strong's and look at the key words in Greek. You'll be amazed at what they say. Ephesians 5, 6. 1 Timothy 6.20, Galatians 4.3, Colossians 2.18, and 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Colossians 2.18, and 1 Corinthians 1, 18-23. Every one of these verses warn about being seduced away from the inspired truths of the Word of God. Every one of them. And if you pull, if you want to look at the Greek words in them, the key ones, not all the prepositions, you'll be amazed at the in-depth warning that's in the Greek. But like I said, it would take us another long time to go through all of them tonight, so I'm going to let them be your homework. Now, the question, the point is, this is what happened to Israel in what we're reading here in Judges 17. But do we see any parallels today? And that's what I want. I'm going to just read from two articles to you. And I, I was thinking about pulling out video. I could have pulled out a ton of examples of this. But let me just read this to you. This was written literally February 12th, 2020. Oh, just now. Yeah. Two days, two days ago. And the title is, What in the Wide World is Going On with the Southern Baptist Convention? <laughs> now, I want you to think about this. If there is an organization of evangelicalism that has been the epitome of it in this country for the last how many years? 50 or more? 
it has been the Southern Baptist Convention. They have been the theological light of the world. Would you agree? Yeah. There's probably no group. I mean, there, there's other groups that are that are good. I'm not saying they're the only one in any way, shape, or form. But I want you to see what's happening to them. This this what what formerly was a theological light that you could look at and know you're pretty much on the right path. Okay, so let me read to you. Uh, uh, on a recent Monday, the pastors' conference of the Southern Baptist Convention, which precedes the annual convention, which will be held in June of this year, announced its lineup of speakers who would be addressing the ministers that are attending this year's event in Orlando, Florida. The headlining name at the top of the announcement from the Baptist Press newspaper is best-selling author Wayne uh, Cordiero, the pastor of New Hope Christian Fellowship in Honolulu, Hawaii. Not only is Cordiero not a Southern Baptist, he's not even sound in doctrine. He is a pastor of the well-known Four Square Church, a Pentecostal denomination founded by a heretic and con artist named Amy Semple McPherson. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Cordero is cut from the same cloth as Joel Olstein, Joseph Prince, and others. He's a prosperity preaching motivational speaker disguised as a pastor who wants you to live, quote, your best life now. It's one of his slogans. Cordero preaches things like, quote, Jesus came as a dream releaser. This is one of the things he teaches. And he also talks about, quote, nothing can rival the power of the dream God has given that's in you. This is his theology. But, quote, another statement from him, unless that potential is recognized and released, it remains richly unproductive in you. This according to his recent book called The Dream Releasers. Cordero's uh, church has a pastor on staff who also is a woman named Cindy Burgess. Now, the importance is this. The Southern Baptist Convention Statement of Faith, okay, as, as made its recent revision in the Baptist Faith and Message of the year 2000, states, quote, while both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastors is limited to men, men as qualified by the Scripture. So the Southern Baptist Convention is violating their own board of code, of code about who should do what. Furthermore, the list of speakers also includes Hosanna Wong, who's called a spoken word artist, who will, quote, perform some kind of poetry performance backed by music. That's another speaker at the Southern Baptist Convention. Okay? I do. Also on the docket for June's convention for the Pastors Conference is Jim Saibala, pastor of the famed Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. By the way, this is tragic because I've been to the book, book Brooklyn Trab at, at Tabernacle on 14th Avenue in New York City in years past, and it was a wonderful church. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm talking about 20 years ago. But here's what's happened to this church. That's what I'm saying. The Brooklyn Tabernacle now believes in an unbiblical second baptism of the Holy Spirit, as mentioned in their current statement of faith. Now you have to have two baptisms of the Holy Spirit so that you can receive more enlightenment from above. Another speaker, Phil Wickham, is leading worship. And as I've warned elsewhere, Wickham is associated with the heretical Bethel Church in Redding, California. Even Albert Muller, the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, has said that Bethel Church, who held uh, their week-long ceremony called the Dead Raising Ceremony, that sounds biblical, doesn't it? Okay. 
he stained the, this this uh, president of the Theolo- Southern Baptist Theological Seminary months ago claimed that Bethel Church, quote, is not a church at all in any biblical sense. One of the other speakers coming up in this Southern Baptist Convention is David Hughes, senior pastor of the Church of the Glades in Coral Springs, Florida. Also, Chris Roseborough of the Pirate Christian Radio who's been warning for years about the idolatry in this church, lacking any clear preaching of the gospel whatsoever. About four years ago, Church by the Glades, it's called, featured a stormtrooper dance with people on stage dressed as Star Wars characters doing crotch thrusts to the, to the tune Don't Stop Until You Get Enough by the Jackson Five. This was their worship in this church. This church also has featured their worship leaders doing cover songs by Katy Perry, Beyonce, and Britney Spears. Matter of fact, they use the Spears song that is called Circus with lyrics like, quote, well, baby, I'm putting on a, sh- um, on a show kind of girl, and quote, when I crack the whip, everybody's going to trip. This is what they're singing, or these songs in their church. The performance put on by the church, by the Glades, it's called, was every bit as provocative as it sounds. As a matter of fact, here are some pictures of what they propose. The first one I'm going to show you in a minute, although I'll just turn it and maybe you can see it. It's an image that was shared just yesterday by David Hughes on his Instagram account. These are the invitations that they're handing out to attend to attend their church at the Glades, using sexually alluring advertising to share this, quote, victorious secret that is a playoff of the lingerie models. Okay, this is what they're handing out as bills to come to their church, okay? The images inside are models of the victorious secret, okay? Uh, apparently they are. I mean, half the is on the... I know. That's true. So, I mean, who's their audience? Well, it's whoever is interested in coming, and that's who they're enticing. Mm-hmm. And he's good. Now, here's one that you'll really enjoy. David Hughes has created this replica of the Iron Throne of the HBO show, The Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Okay? Of course, this work... Uh, the, this he's worked into a, a gimmick, into a sermon series, and people are actually allowed to take, come and take pictures sitting on this Iron Throne. The Game of Thrones, of course, is a night-themed porn show that Christians should have nothing to do with. So he literally, if you can see this, I can pass around, yeah. had this Iron Throne main made in his, that sits in his church so that he could sit on it and give these sermons. Okay? Nice, don't you think? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Still, here's, a, uh, here's also uh, a performance from what they call circus. This is a musical performance that they do in their church. With hip, with hip spinning and all of its sexually suggestive lyrics, they all, this also includes jugglers and clowns all around the stage during their show, giving credence to an interesting prophetic statement by Charles Spurgeon. You remember the famous theologian Spurgeon? Okay, Spurgeon said the following. He says, quote, the church at some point in time will come, will come at a time where instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. What a prophetic statement by Spurgeon. It's a clown circus that somehow they're alluring Christians to come and be part of. Tim, isn't that a real trade-off compared to the things you've been teaching in the Old Testament? So to go back to how they were with Egypt and uh, the different countries, from every one of them that you talked about, they all did some of these crazy things in, in building the idols. They did. So what's so strange? I mean, we've had a lot of that in our world. We have. Over the years. But we've never had it in the Southern Baptist Convention. 
we've never had it in, in traditional evangelicalism. And as I've said to you many times, evangelicalism in America is dying. And it's being replaced by a syncretistic religiosity that pulls in things from the world, from hip hop, from modern songs, from the Game of Thrones. Okay. As a matter of fact, I saw a video not long ago done by Hillsong. Does anyone remember Hillsong? Yes, you do. Twenty years ago, Hillsong was a was a evangelical church. It had good preaching and had remarkable uh, Christ, uh, music, uh, worship music. Hillsong recently did a version of Cirque du Soleil, literally, where they had in their music, their worship music, and I saw the video, scantily dressed women doing Cirque du Soleil on trapezes and poles. This, in the church. This was what Hillsong was doing. Hillsong has become, and I, I'm not trying to judge, I think the, the, the scripture judges it, it has become apostate. Apostate. And the Southern Baptist Convention is getting close to that also. That's exactly why I'm going through this. Exactly. I'm glad you made the connection that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Every day now. It is. This is what this is what this is why when you see a mega church that has to have a twenty five foot video screen and a rock band, okay? And and bring on the most modern music possible and talk about how you can live your life with joy and have fun, and, you know, and all this. I'm going to tell you, if that's the church you walk into, walk out of it. Don't go there because you're not going to hear the gospel of Christ. You're not going to hear the identification truths that Paul teaches all through the epistles. You're not going to hear it there. Okay, you're going to hear something that is absolutely blasphemous compared to the New Testament teaching. There's an, I won't go on because you get the idea. There's another one. Well, maybe I will quote something from this. There's another article I pulled called Liberal Evangelical Overlords Come Unglued. And it's a quote of people who have been traditionally evangelical in some of the things that they're now saying. I'll mention a well-known publication called Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission recently congratulated Mitt Romney for voting to convict Donald Trump. Okay? Uh, and they saying that they praised uh, uh, Obama's faith-based programs because they thought they were in the spirit of Christ. Also, a, write, a writer in that same journal named Thomas Kidd also talked about the fact that Trump supporters were hated Muslims and immigrants and that evangelicals who supported Trump because uh, the evangelicals support Trump because of their hostility towards Muslims and immigrants. He also said that, uh, that it isn't good that Tr Trump is pro-life uh, because that's turning people away. Also, in this same article, it says that this week, the formerly Christian, Christian magazine, uh, of course, called Christianity Today, is quoted as praising, uh, in one of its recent, art, it's being praised by people in one of its recent articles because it appeases the LGBTQ people, uh, uh, by using pronouns of that n nomenclature, okay? This is in Christianity Today. Bible teacher Beth Moore, oh, yeah. how many people have in the past known of Beth Moore Bible studies? Mm -hmm. Very, very, yes, very, very well-known uh, individual, okay? She says recently in an article that, actually in Christianity Today, that she stands against Donald Trump ca calling anyone who supports him a jar of nuts. She says it's a great shame 
of every Southern Baptist that Russell Moore, uh, 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 who, who, by the way, Russell, Russell Moore claimed that he wanted a wife more like Hillary Clinton. It's really interesting. That they that that she condemns, yeah. That she condemns uh, them for you for uh, uh, for their position uh, of supposed uh, conservative denominationalism uh, because they uh, would dare you know uh, support any of, of Trump's policies, and of course it goes on and on about all these other people. All these people, many of these people who have been considered traditional evangelicals are now saying the most apostate, hyper-liberal things. They have completely departed from any reason of any sense of biblical teaching. At any rate, I could go on and on about this. Deceive many. Even the elect, and he's doing apparently a very good job at this point. Okay. Well, the Methodists went through that. They've gone through several revisions. Well, they've gone through many revisions. You know, back in the fifties, the Methodists departed fundamentally from traditional teaching. That's why the Evangelical United Brethren split from the Methodist Church back then. You know, they've gone on for the ordination of women. They've gone on for the ordination of gay or lesbian female pastors. And they're as far gone as you can see. So have the Presbyterians. So have the Church of Christ. You know, pardon? Lutherans have also gone that way. Only the Missouri Senate. When I was a little girl, and I was a little girl many, many, many years ago, we belonged to the United Brothers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Very Bible. I mean, that's all you ever heard. You yes. Know? And you know, I was shocked to hear that they had. Yeah. Totally you know, the, the Brethren Church of America. Okay, another example of what formerly was a conservative denomination. Now you in the in United Brethren Church, they're both now very, totally liberal. You know, the only one that's left that's reasonably conservative is an offshoot of them. Grace Brethren. But even so, Grace Brethren is... It's having its problems yeah, significantly. Right there are some very serious problems that the Grace Brethren is now having, too, that's very disheartening, particularly to those that have been a part of it in years past. Right. Now, here's what we're left with today, okay? <laughs> the Bible. Today, if you say you're spiritual but not religious, you're okay. And I'm telling you, this is exactly how, when you read articles, okay, the phrase is, I'm spiritual but not religious, right? Isn't that true? Okay. Now, here's, that's widely accepted. That means that you believe in Christian yoga, Christian meditation, you pray to angels, you worship Mother Earth, you recite mantras, you practice chakras. What is that? Chakras are the Indian view version of energy. Right. Okay. And therefore, you can dabble in the occult, join Wicca, etc. But if you claim conservative evangelical Bible-based faith, you are a narrow person, you are intolerant, you are exclusive, you are a racist, you are a white supremacist, you are a bigot, you are a homophobe, and you are a hater. And who's the liberal elements of society, right. and there's a lot of them. Right. Right. Easily 50% of the population or more is this way. What were those first couple of things you said, judgmental? And I'll, I'll read them again. The first Here's what they call traditional evangelical Orthodox Christians. They call them narrow-minded, intolerant, we are. exclusive, we are. racist, no, no. white supremacist, no. bigots, no. homophobes, no. and haters. No. The reason why I said that in the beginning, those first, that's why I had to read them, because when you come down to it, we believe in, you know, Jesus Christ, the 
Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, is the Bible, and what the Bible right. is absolute. Right. So yes, we are a bit narrow in our. We are narrow in relationship to truth because we reject falsehood, and that's the problem. But that's not the way the world is now. Now, I'm suggesting to you that all of these elements make us ripe for, for future persecution, okay? And I believe that it will occur, and I believe that where it will start will be in what we call churched people, they will be the source. There's a book written by Tom Horn, and I think you've read it, called Blood on the Altar. Oh, yeah. It's an excellent book, mm -hmm. and it tells you why it is that the supposed church people are going to be the ones most likely to turn against the true Orthodox Christians. Matthew 10 says in two different places, beware of men and talks in two places about persecution. It's, we're on the edge of it right now, I'm afraid. I think it's coming and it's all set up. Now, like you said, Anna, back to, back to our text. Okay. In Judges 17, we read verse 6. And in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's reiterated also in Judges 18.1, Judges 19.1, and the last verse of Judges, Judges 21.25. It's the theme of an era. No king represents no authority. Okay? In other words, everyone, in other words everyone has the right to define morality in their own way. There's no concept in our culture anymore of absolute truth. Morality is completely relative in today's world. And if you claim that it's absolute in nature, you will be persecuted by those, and they will be violently in disagreement with you, because they'll say you're judging what they believe is right. You have no right to judge them. But they have right to judge Of course. That, they never see that. This, this, of course, uh, will lead in our culture to increased abortion. It will lead and has be now begun to lead to infanticide. We never thought there would be infanticide, did we? Sh Francis Schaeffer, in his, in his work in the 70s and 80s, wrote extensively about abortion and infanticide. He wrote books about it, warning American culture that this is where they were heading. What did Northup, governor of Virginia, just do last year? He signed a law that if a child is born and taken out of the womb, the mother has the right to decide whether the child should live or not. They are outside the womb. They are breathing air. And yet the mother has the right in Virginia to kill that child if she says it's not worthy of life. That's infanticide. Okay? That's infanticide. Also, we will see euthanasia. It will progress. There will be groups of people that will be deemed not worthy of living, not worthy of medical care, not worthy of hospital care. It's coming. Okay? Absolutely. And particularly if you sit in a political spectrum or a, or a spiritual spectrum in which you're considered persona non grata, then, okay? We will also see increases in assisted suicide because people will define their own life and when they think they should have an end to it and want laws to change so that others can assist them in it. And eventually this will all lead to the ultimate, I guarantee you, because it always has led that way, and that's genocide. There will be segments of society that will not be considered worth living they will be persecuted and eliminated by other segments of society. We've seen it time again. We've seen it since Stalin's era. We've seen it in Mao's era. We've seen it in the persecution of the, uh, uh, by the Turks, of the Armenians. We've seen it in Pol Pot, and, uh, in the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, and on and on and on. 
and what will start it off, I will say this, I'm not a prophet, but it's not hard to read history and see it's rhyming. What will start it off is if this country effectively is able to eliminate gun ownership. I don't say this because I'm personally in love with guns, but I'm telling you, the founders of the Constitution made the Second Amendment the cornerstone, for, in my opinion, for the rest of them. Now, you have a much greater understanding of the law than I do. But to me, they made the Second Amendment because they said, David, tell us, they said that people have the right to own weapons because if any government... If, if, if the government... Right. Then the people have the right to have guns to defend themselves. Exactly. The purpose of the Second Amendment was to remove a government that they felt no longer represented the people. It was all about the will of the people, not the will of the central government. Right? That's the U.S. Constitution. And if gun ownership is removed effectively, let me assure you there will be nothing left to the U.S. Constitution. There will be nothing left to protect from genocide, because that's the pattern of the world. Take away guns, and genocide in a culture comes next. That's right. <laughs> right. Now. And see how things have changed. When I was inducted into the Army, I pledged allegiance to the country. Yes. And against all enemies. Without and within. Foreign and domestic. So. Now, in our culture, we are now in bondage. And one of the things that we're in absolute bondage to is a completely radical concept of insane political correctness. Political correctness has become insanity in our culture. They can define anything the way they think it should be, not using the normal understanding of language whatsoever, and they end up then persecuting groups of people and, of course, delegitimizing them by defining them the way they want to. If you would happen to live in the South and happen to have a Confederate flag on your property, which, of course, was the tradition of the South during and even during the Civil War, then you're delegitimized because now you're absolutely a white racist. Mm -hmm. If you would st study the Southern con the Confederacy and the generals of the South, you are a white racist. You're not studying the Civil War as history, you see. There's no longer a concept. It's history. Mm -hmm. It's now been turned into racism mm -hmm. and the elements of racism. This is what political correctness does. So... Yes, it's true. If you, if you read what Lincoln went through, uh, and you read what happened, uh, and then after the war, and you read what Congress wanted to do to Jefferson Davis, uh, you you had everything that you just said occur following the Civil War. Right. All of the things that you're talking about, because there weren't any more churches in the South. They've been burned. So when you go from Virginia south and then over across to Texas, when we won the North, they absolutely tore the rest of the country apart. And you, if you think about what you're saying there, if you read about what the Congress tried to do to Jefferson Davis as the former president of the Better, so there, everything that you spoke of yeah. occurred back then. Okay, now you know this. I'm going to say it. I know you know the answer to it, but look what they did to Robert E. Robert e. Lee. Robert E. Lee lo owned a beautiful plantation in Virginia. What do we call it today, Norman? You want an honest answer? I don't remember. Okay, Arlington National Cemetery. Oh. They took away his plantation to punish him and decided to put all the dead soldiers that his Confederacy killed on his plantation. 
<laughs> okay? At any rate. There was a lot of hatred back there. There was. And a lot of things that you're talking about there, if you put it to, to history, it seems like we go from up here, down here. We do. Up here, and here. And we do it in 80-year cycles, approximately. And that's what's been interesting. Now, there's a man named Kevin Jackson. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kevin Jackson. I get his emails every day. He he's a he's a black guy, you know, Native American. He's a black African American. His name's Kevin Jackson. He I believe Kevin used to be a commentator on Fox News in years past. He went off Fox. He started his own site. It's called the Black Sphere. Okay, and he he's he's hilarious to me, but he's so politically incorrect. Okay, he calls the Democratic Party the party of lynching Negroes. Now, you know why he says that? Because because who started the Ku Klux Klan? The Democratic Party. The Republican Party didn't exist back then. The Republican Party, to my knowledge, only started with Abraham Lincoln, the GOP. Right. That's when it started. So. It's pretty, but, you know, yes, yes. But when you're looking at the Southern uh, individuals, that all started at the time that our country began. And the Southerners needed the slaves in order to work them. They did. Yeah. We had a divided nation that came into conflict. And today we have, I will claim, as divided a nation as we did in 1858. I don't think we do. Oh, I do. Oh, I do. Oh, my gosh. There's a level of hatred of the left towards the right that is, to my knowledge and my experience, has never existed. Turn the TV off, the social media, and turn off the newspapers, and then look at it and see what you see. Well, go to the grocery store, go to the shopping store. No, I agree with you. On a, a on a person to person level, you don't see that. But what do people watch? Where do they get their information from? The media and all its sorts. So they they believe this stuff. That's the tragedy. Now let let's finish. I'm going to say it depends on what area that you live in. I'm sorry to say that, but if you live in the white rich, you know, yeah. The neighbor to neighbor, everybody's cool. But if you go into the more poverty stricken areas, you get a different concept. Yeah. Well, I totally guess, concept. I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you there because I had the experience of being in the very poverty area okay. in southern Columbus and the east side. Uh, I appreciate why you say that, mm-hmm. uh, but some of those people are some of the strongest Christians you're going to want to see. They can be. They can be. Now, let's read verses seven through thirteen. Oh, we're back. Yeah, we're we're trying we're trying to finish this. You know, no, we're not. But can you see how prophetic this is? It's remarkably prophetic. All right, so let's read seven through thirteen to finish off the chapter. Now, there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah who was a Levite, and he was staying there, there meaning the house of Micah, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he was staying there in Bethlehem. Then, verse 8, then the man departed from the city, from Bethlehem and Judah, to stay wherever he might find a place. And he made his journey, and he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, all right? Verse 9, and Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to stay wherever I may find a place. Micah then said to him, dwell with me and be a father and priest to me, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, a suit of clothes, and your maintenance. So the Levite went in. And the Levite agreed to live with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. 
So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me, seeing I have a Levite as a priest. Now, all right, now let's take this apart based on the Torah, and I'll show you how bizarre this one is, okay? So the young man shows up. It describes him as a a Bethlehemite. He lived in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah. Well, Bethlehem does indeed at the, in the very edge of the tribe of Judah. That is correct. All right? Matter of fact, I want you to turn, keep your hand in Judges here, but I want you to turn to uh, Joshua 21. So you're not going back very far. Joshua chapter 21. Now, I want you to see something. I want you to look at verse 4 of Joshua 21. Remember, this is where they come into the land. They've appreciably conquered it. The tribes are now given by God's lot. They don't choose where they go, except for the east side a little bit. God allowed them to choose the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan. But the rest of them, they're given a lot. They go where God says for them to go. Verse 4, Then the lot came out for the families of the Korathites, that is, the sons of Aaron, the priest, who were of the Levites, and they received 13 cities by the lot from the tribe of Judah and from the tribe of Simeonites and from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, what this refers to is that even though the 12 tribes were given their areas, each one of them had to give up a series of cities that were the cities of the Levites. Therefore, the cities of the Levites were not owned by the tribe. The Levites, remember, were never given a tribal area per se. They were given 48 cities in total around the country. So there was... There were Levite cities in in Judah. I just want you to point that out. Okay. Now. Was Bethlehem one of them? No, it was not. I'm going to point that out to you in a second. It's a good question. All right. Now I want you to also look, since you're in Joshua, turn back to Deuteronomy. I want to go to chapter 12. I want you to look at verse 19. Deuteronomy 12, verse 19. This is a very important warning that God gives Israel. All right? Verse 19, Deuteronomy 12. Be careful that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. So God warns Israel. Don't mistreat the Levites. Mm-hmm. Honor the Levites. Give them their due. Remember, the tithe came from the other tribes, and who did it go to? Levites. Okay? They were given special privileges around their cities to grow food. Of course, they had the priestly service, and they were paid because they didn't own property other than the 48 cities by this tri- by the tithe. Okay? Now, Bethlehem, as you asked, was not a Levitical city. It was not one of the 48 that was appointed. And, of course, as we know, the tribe of Judah is not the tribe of Levi. Now, some commentators look at this passage and disagree. Okay? Some see this man as having Levite heritage, and some don't see him as having Levite heritage because, for instance, Bethlehem was not a Levitical city. Okay? Now, also, some commentators go back to Joshua chapter 17. Some commentators also believe that he is the person named 
turn to the next chapter, Joshua, or Joshua, Judges 18. So go to the next chapter, Judges 18, and look at verse 30 and 31. And the sons of Dan set up for themselves the graven image. This is not good. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. Now, that's a very interesting word in Hebrew. Manasseh, depending on whether you, how you write the Hebrew letter, can either mean the tribe of Manasseh or can mean Moses. It's all, and it's a very slight change in the Hebrew, depending on which one it means. So it could be interpreted the son of Moses. He and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of captivity of the land. And then it says, interestingly enough, verse 31, and here's the connection. So they set up for themselves Micah's graven image, which he had made all the time that the house of God was at Shiloh. So some people think that this person who came was named Jonathan, and he's the one referred to in, that we just read in, uh, in Judges 18, 30, and 31. Okay? Now, to finish off, either way, either way you decide whether he's a Levite or not a Levite, okay, he left Bethlehem and Judah to, quote, find work or employment, which means that if he was a Levite, then Israel had forsaken their duty to support the Levites, right? Because he isn't staying where he was. He has to leave because he can't find employment anyway. So Israel had forsaken their duty to support the Levites, as we just read in Deuteronomy 12:19. God warns them, don't ever forsake your duty to the Levites. Also, if you want to see another interesting passage to close this off, turn to Nehemiah chapter 13. So go to your right past 1st and 2nd Samuel, the Kings, Chronicles, Nehemiah Nehemiah 13, and look at Verse 10, Nehemiah says, I also discovered the portions of the Levites had not been given them, so that the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. Okay, another example during the times of Nehemiah, even after the Babylonian captivity, that Israel did not follow the Torah. They did not follow the law. They did not support the Levites as they were supposed to. So this man finds Micah's house. Micah d- decides that he's a Levite, which may or may not be the case. And Micah wants to legitimize his, quote, house of God. So he offers to hire this man, gives him a salary, clothing, and food. Do you see that? Okay. So Micah hires him to be a father, that is an instructor, and a priest, okay, to live there in the house, this house of God. Now remember what this house contains, family idols, two graven images, an ephod, and who knows what else is in it, but it's all very idolatrous. Now, it's also interesting to remember the, Eph- the Levites, as b- had been mentioned, the, the rest of Israel was required to give 10% tithe. Notice what Micah does of his mother's silver, okay, which he has at least 900 pieces left because he only took 200 to make these graven images, right? right. He offers this, quote, Levite, uh, a, a salary of 10 pieces of silver per year. Now, if he was tithing and they had 900 pieces of silver, he should get at least 90 pieces of silver a year. So once again, he's not really doing a Levitical tithe to him whatsoever. 
So he gets his 10 per year. Also, I think there's great suspicion in the language that by legitimizing this house of God he sets up, and by legitimizing it with a Levite who wears an ephod, I think he intends to make a profit by people coming and worshiping and tithing to this house of God. I think that's what the implication is. There's going to be a monetary system here that Micah is going to make off, make out on. Now, Micah, by what authority we don't know, appoints or consecrates him as a priest to this Micah's house. So, here we see he sets up a religious system that's an absolute mishmash of every imaginable kind of idolatry. And, of course, he, quote, feels assured that the Lord will bless him. Isn't it interesting? Turn to Numbers chapter 3, verse 10. Numbers chapter 3, verse 10. Okay. Verse 10. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons that they may keep their priesthood, but the layman who comes near shall be put to death. I think that Micah is making a great assumption to presume that the Lord's going to bless him. Okay? As a matter of fact, we won't go here because I've gone long tonight, but you might note that in number 16, verses 10, 31, and 32, is the story of Korah, who was a Levite, who decided to usurp the priesthood for his own purposes, and what happens? God opens the earth, and it swallows he and his followers up in it. So I think this guy's on very thin ground to presume that he's going to get the blessing of God. Well, he claims it. It's possible that since we're having so many sinkholes that we're dealing with. <laughs> Possibly. So, to finish, I want to quote Isaiah 50. And then we'll stop. Isaiah 50, verses 10 and 11. He who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire and among the brands that you set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. In other words, self-reliance to illuminate the dark other than the word of God will not go well. Okay? It's only the word of God that eliminates. So, that is chapter 17. Okay? So, would you like to? Okay.